You're watching the Conservative Talks brought to you by the ECR Party, your weekly Q&A show on the deeper themes driving the European news cycle. I'm your host, Jorge Gonzalez Galarza. Every week, an expert roster of authors, lawmakers, and newsmakers will join me to unpack the events rocking the European Union's foundations in a short, digestible format from a conservative and Eurorealist angle. Welcome to another episode in our series, and today we are so delighted to be discussing uh, with uh, David Engels, who's a dear friend of uh, Eurorealists uh, across the continent and, and conservatives at large. Uh, David is, um, is uh, you know, a, a, a historian by training. He's a scholar of uh, ancient history. He published widely whilst in his native uh, Belgium, uh, worked as a scholar and as a, as a professor at several uh, institutions in Belgium before uh, finding uh, an exile of sorts in Poland, where he's, where, where he's currently tuning in from. But he's got a uh, really a very interesting scholarly career across academe uh, in different parts of Europe. He's now uh, a, um, a a scholar affiliated with the Zakodny Institute in Poznań in in Poland, and uh, perhaps most interest most interestingly for our purposes today, uh, David has uh, spent really. Uh, really a considerable amount of time over the past, um, let's say, five to 10 years reflecting and, um, and really analyzing and, 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 and looking at the, um, uh, at the juncture in this thing that we call Europe, historically, the place we're at in this, in this process of uh, bringing European nations together on a, a common set of institutions and values. And um, David's last project, his last kind of large uh, book is really a fascinating book. We'll, uh, we'll provide the links. Uh, it is called uh, uh, Renovatio Europae, and we, I really want to get into David into just the, the richness and the wealth of, um, of uh, intellectual um, uh, you know, a content that is in the book. It's structured as a series of chapters, uh, some of which were written by uh, yourself, David. Uh, others you've kind of brought, uh, you've, you've uh, brought, um, you've brought uh, a number of intellectuals that also want to discuss. And, um, you know, let's, let's get right into the heart of it, perhaps by asking you what was, what was the, I guess, the, um, uh, the dynamic leading up to the publication of uh, Innovatio Europae? What was, what was sort of the driving purpose? What were uh, these uh, working groups that you convened in Poland like? What was the uh, driving kind of theme that you were looking to analyze with all the people that you brought together and kind of the process leading up to the publication of the book. Yeah, hi Holger first, and thank you, thank you very much for for the kind uh, invitation. I'm really happy to have this 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 chat with you. Thank you for your interest also in our book uh, Renovatio Europa, um, which uh, was one of my first projects at the Institut Zachodni when I when I moved to to Poland in 2018. And there are, there, are, there, are, there are several origins of that book. On the one hand, there is, of course, my own personal commitment to the question of European, what I would call European patriotism. I, I feel deeply convicted about my identity, not just as a, as a Belgian or as a bilingual French-German speaker, but also about being, being a European, being a Westerner. That is, for me, my true, my true nation, you could say. But a nation which I don't see uh, in an EU fashion as... Uh, uh, um, European being identical with uh, universalist, cosmopolitan, multicultural, politically correct values and so on, but rather an identity that is deeply rooted in our history, in our tradition, that makes us unique, that makes us very different, not, not better or worse, but very different from the Chinese, the Indians, the Muslims, etc. And so uh, the, the, the wish to somehow contribute to to uh, um, uh, reconstructing some form of, of cultural patriotism was always very important for me. Then when I came to, to Poland, uh, to, to the Institut Zachodny, um, we very quickly uh, agreed also uh, uh, with, with the director of the, of the Institute that it would really be an important sign, precisely because it would be coming from Poland, to show that the um, conservative institutions, conservative countries, such as most of the Visegrad countries, 
uh, do not want to be presented as standing for chauvinism, nationalism, um, just thinking about their own interest, thinking better than others, but rather to show that their, their approach to conservatism is also a, a deeply European and Western uh, approach. And so we, we had this idea of uh, trying to, to, to switch from the usual criticism of everything that, that goes wrong with the European Union, rather to a constructive idea how could we do something better? What, what could be a, a, constructing, a constructive idea of uh, um, renovating the uh, European Union uh, and with it Europe, which is why we, we called our book also Renovatio Europae, a little bit like uh, uh, in, in allusion to the famous uh, Renovatio Imperi of the uh, uh, early uh, early medieval rulers, also tried to, to renovate, to reinstall uh, the lost, uh, uh, long lost old uh, Roman uh, Empire. That is why I then quickly uh, managed to find a, a series of uh, quite well-known European scholars coming from many European nations and uh, agreeing to deal with different aspects of this identity crisis of Europe, but also on some very concrete proposals, how we could overcome these, these crises and go towards real Renovatio Europa. This is, this is tremendously useful, and I think it's so, it's so important to kind of set... Um, really the meat of your book and the intellectual meat uh, that you develop in these uh, chapters in the wider context of the juncture that we're in and kind of what was happening around us in, uh, in Europe as you work to uh, bring uh, people together uh, at your institute uh, and have them reflect on just all of the moving parts and all the different pieces of the puzzle uh, that we're faced with. And I, I think, you know, I think it is so important. Uh, I do want to remind our audience that you are a uh, cultural historian, that you were a scholar of uh, ancient history in Europe at large, looking at sort of the long-term trends um, that have made who we are. And I think that's, that really is, um, that really kind of uh, re reverberates across your book. And, um, you know, perhaps uh, something that I really, that I found really interesting that I'd love to delve into uh, right away is this, this idea of, of um, wanting to focus on what you call identity and values as opposed to institutions and economics. And the latter two, as you explain in the book, have been really the sort of the overwhelming, the overweening concern of uh, the elites that have tried to sort of integrate Europe, uh, which, isn't, which isn't a concern per se, but they've, they've gone about it in a way that really has disregarded uh, some of the things in, in your book and the idea of a European uh, culture that should be put forth, that should be valued. Um, and what I found most interesting was that you, uh, your own uh, chapters quote, uh, some of the founding fathers of the current supranational idea of Europe as, as having for, forewarned that Europe had to focus on institutions and values if, it, if the, uh, and, and my apologies, Europe had to focus on um, identity and values if the institutions and the economics were to succeed. Uh, can you perhaps delve into a little bit, uh, a little bit deeper into where you see this conflict uh, arising in, in Europe today and why it is so important that we shift the focus back towards the underpinning uh, thicket of values and identity that underpins this whole thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, with pleasure. Well, I mean, with, with every society, every state, um, they can only function if they are based on, on, a cit on, on a citizenry that feels some form of solidarity between themselves. Huh? A state can only function if uh, the uh, inhabitants of the richer regions of the state agree somehow to feel solidarity with those of the poorer parts of this country and to all pay their, their taxes in order to assure some form of, of equality. Uh, so just when people feel a common identity uh, or, 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 or people need a feeling of solidarity in order for states or societies to work, but you can only feel this form of solidarity if you share also a common identity. You, you have to realize that you have something in common with someone else in order to be solidarity with him. From the moment on what you think, well, I have nothing to do with that guy, then <laughs> it is very different, uh, difficult to, to somehow convince him to, to give parts of his, his, his labor, his, uh, 
into his money or what else to 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 a common goal. And the, the problem now is that while we still feel somehow this solidarity on a on a national basis, the European Union has uh, unfortunately not managed to create or rather to underline this form of common European identity. They have only settled on the issue of, of human rights, of a universalist identity. They have uh, uh, and, and have uh, um, lost the occasion to underline what, what makes Europe very, very special and why for example, <coughs> in, a in a situation of, of economic crisis, uh, a German should agree to give some of his tax money to someone from Spain or from Greece when he is in crisis, and why he should rather part with his money from someone from poor European countries than with people in Pakistan or in Indonesia when they have a similar uh, economic problem. Um, and that is one, one of the issues that, that needs to be somehow explained and somehow this identity needs to be underlined. Now, often it is often said that uh, this identity needs to be constructed, that the European Union should make efforts in constructing a common European identity. That is absolutely false in my, from my point of view, because this European identity exists. It is there. It is our common shared history. And um, it is obvious for everyone who goes into a museum in, in Lisbon or in Berlin or in Rome, he immediately sees that we all share for, for centuries, if not millennia, uh, a very uh, a similar history. We, have, uh, we, we are all uh, based on the Judeo-Christian religion. We are all based on Greco-Roman traditions. We have all gone through very similar states of our historical, institutional evolution and so forth and so forth. We, we share so many things within Europe which we do not share with people from China or India who have had a very different civilization, civilizational um, evolution. And so the European Union would have needed to, to insist on these, uh, on these common features, but she, she or it, it hasn't. And um, now there is, of course, the question why. And often, um, already at the beginning of the uh, European communities, uh, people like uh, Robert Schumann, for example, have, have insisted on the fact that Europe needs to, 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 to uh, um, identify itself with its history, with its Christian uh, tradition, not through re-Christianization, but simply through a, a positive attitude to this, to, this, to this heritage and to this tradition. And that should Europe only focus on economics, institutions, um, Europe would lose, lose her, her identity. But I think the things are not that easy because uh, many of these people who say, well, identity cause only trouble, let's just keep focused on purely material, uh, allegedly uh, objective uh, uh, issues such as rules, norms, institutions, and so on. Um, they somehow are not aware of the fact that even below uh, or, or um, yeah below this 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 quest for uh, just looking for for norms institutions economic issues there's also a form of ideology which is of course the the, the liberal ideology which is not necessarily based on just this interest in identity question but which is in some form of identity itself because it says well all that doesn't play any role christian identity greek tradition even, even Muslim identity, all that is just some form of, of superstructure, but the real important things are the material uh, interest of the single individual. And that is not, not just, that is not an absence of ideology, but it is an ideology in itself because it is based on extreme individualism, materialism, uh, and so forth, and leads ultimately to atheism, to hedonism, to collectivism, and to exactly what we are living now. That is the, the transformation of an ultra-liberal system into, very strangely, a collectivist uh, society. That is, that is what we see by now, and that shows us, of course, how what big an error it was at the beginning that those people who still felt strongly about their European identity somehow agreed in leaving this identity out of the construction process uh, and leaving leaving the field or the battlefield to people claiming they were just interested in objective uh, realities, but who 
precisely defended a very specific approach to identity questions. And that is how conservatives somehow lost the battle. They lost it mentally and ideologically. And now they, they, we, are, we are seeing every day how they also lost it in a very concrete political fashion. And they are not even aware of it very often. Hmm. This is this is really interesting. And I think even though your book came out uh, some some uh, time before um, this whole idea of like a conference on the future of Europe started giving concrete results, and we're uh, speaking on the heels of, I believe, earlier this week, uh, the first statement, the first official statement of the um, leaders that had been convened as part of this conference on the future of Europe. That the, the first joint statement got signed this week, I believe, which I think is really a good, um, an interesting news cycle for us to hew to is, and your book somewhat, uh, somewhat does that. Um, but I, th I, th I, th I think it is so interesting, David, because you're, um, I, I do think that the, um, that the, uh, the elite consensus has already realized a lot of the things that, that are on, that are in your book. And we saw that, um, I mean, some of the questions that you've just, uh, outlined in terms of the sort of the tax protest sentiment that around, that aroused, um, around the Eurozone crisis, where a lot of people across the Eurozone started really um, uh, questioning the uh, values foundation of the idea of having financial transfers across the Eurozone. They didn't really, whether it was the German pensioner class or the young Greek, Spanish, Italian, uh, Portuguese unemployed, the underlying um, social compact that kind of from which this idea of financial transfer springs had just been blurted out from the minds of all of these different people. And I think the system at that specific point was already hitting into, was already hitting its face against a wall that you, that you are outlining your book. Um, something else that I find incredibly important uh, in your book is that there is a larger Western backstory to this and kind of the uh, liberal liberalist hubris of the 1990s. Uh, in which the European Union played a massive role, not just in sp spurring it worldwide, but also in embracing all of its premises in terms of believing really and embracing this idea that you didn't have to focus on the underlying sense of belonging that binds human people, uh, human beings together. And as long as you just took care of the material well-being and the um, symbolic well-being in terms of people finding uh, emancipation and liberal license and the ability of being able to do whatever they want with their lives. Um, the liberal, the liberalist hot, uh, hubris of those decades, and I think we're seeing, we're seeing it crumble worldwide right now, but that was, that was a moment in time when uh, we totally disregarded uh, all, all of the important uh, building blocks that are in your book. Um, so I, I want to maybe kind of turn uh, towards more of a um, foresight uh, problem that is really in your book as well towards the end is, you're, you're a pessimistic guy, as, as are conservatives at, at large, but uh, where, is, where, where are you least pessimistic, where are you most hopeful that change is going to come from? One of, the, one of the building blocks in your book is really uh, awakening Europeans to the, um, I don't want to call it clash of civilizations, I would just merely call it uh, the idea of Europe being uh, just a, a, a place of its own in, in a world uh, riven by conflict and riven by different geostrategic and even cultural outlooks. So what are you most hopeful that the change that you advocate is going to come from? Is it going to come from geopolitics and the idea that we're now seeing being flo floated, floated around in Brussels and some of the high places in Europe uh, in terms of strategic autonomy and the idea of Europe being able to chart its own course in the, uh, in the League of Nations? Are you most hopeful about quite simply kind of the penetration of different cultural outlooks into our own uh, urban uh, uh, like cities and, and, uh, and, and European capitals. Where do you think that the change towards uh, a self-confident uh, European culture is the basis for the European uh, project, however you define that? Where do you think that, where are you most hopeful that that's going to eventually come from? Yeah, that's, that's of course a very hypothetical question, so it's difficult to respond to that. You, you, you're absolutely true. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm a pessimist somehow, uh, even more so as I, I'm um, very strongly interested in, in uh, morphological structures uh, in the philosophy of history, uh, especially, of course, Oswald Spengler, who is uh, one of the thinkers which has really deeply influenced me um, because of his basic idea that civilizations, exactly like all social entities, 
entities and like physical beings have somehow a certain mortality. That is, they evolve, they grow, then they decline, and then they die. So civilizations are not immortal and uh, history is not teleological or linear, but it happens rather in, in, in cultural cycles. And it seems to me at least uh, obvious and to many, many other people too, that um, the uh, Western civilization cycle is approaching its end. It, it's not yet absolutely there. And this, this end doesn't mean a cataclysm where everything breaks down, but at least a phase when uh, people stop to be interested in their own history, when they prefer to enter in some form of post-historical uh, feeling, some form of disconnection, with their own tradition, when their cultural creativity is waning, and when they simply s just limit themselves to their interest for their own small personal well-being and not necessarily fight for their family, for their religion, for their state, for their culture, for their belief, for their creed, or whatever, just interested in themselves. And so that makes them, of course, prey to all other influences, being from a small elite from the within who can take the power without having too much to fear as resistance, or be it from barbarian forces or from enemies from the without. And I think we are slowly starting to really approach that that post-historical phase in the West. So that is that is why I'm quite pessimist. But still, when it comes to somehow uh, imposing at least some final political unity to the European world, a bit in analogy to the transformation of the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire, which is a bit my speciality when it comes to to ancient history. I think that something like that may still be possible as we are entering now, I think, a phase of, of a strong social and political unrest that is already extremely obvious in some countries, such as France, for example, which is really at the, at the, at the brink of some form of latent civil, civil war and something else is similar, is happening also in many towns, I think, in Belgium and even in the UK. And this transformation phase is, on the one hand, something that I personally would have liked to, to avoid because it, it will bring with us extreme hardship and the coronavirus lockdown and lockdown measures are, of course, accelerating this this process of, of uh, dismantling of the West of Europe. But on the, on the other hand, this could also be a chance. It, it, it could be uh, the opportunity of uh, seeing uh, a reform program implemented at least at the end of this transformation phase. And I think that is more important than ever for conservatives all over Europe and especially in Western Europe uh, to, um, to, to become proud again about their, their cultural values, to somehow uh, try to, to defend their identity in this cultural war that is, that is approaching. You could say indeed that I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pessimist when it comes to the general outlook on the um, future of Western civilization. But on the other hand, I guess that this, this phase of, of um, civil unrest, of disorder, might also be a chance of seeing European conservatives implement their, their own agenda. And I think it is really important that uh, we, we manage uh, through that, that, that difficult period that is to come to somehow uh, assert our own worldview, to, to conserve also our, our tradition, to be an example, not just in a political way, but also to being a, a credible example as, 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 as a society of human beings, showing that through a certain cultural patriotism, to sort of loyalty to our values, such as traditions, such as life, such as our Greco-Roman traditions, such as also Judeo-Christian beliefs, it will be possible to maintain our cause, to guarantee some form also of social justice, at least for for the people also belonging uh, to to our our zone of influence throughout these years, and then uh, sooner or later uh, again develop some form also of political credibility that could help in in somehow reforming what then will remain of of Western Europe, because it is obvious that uh, the uh, coronavirus crisis and all these different social um, uh, um, uh, elements of crisis will become more and more obvious during these next years years and see uh, a uh, fundamental um, uh, questioning of the ancient 
power structures as they have evolved since the 1950s, since the 1960s. I think that many Western European countries are already now at the brink of, of realizing that our traditional liberal democratic parliamentary state system is somehow not adapted anymore to the different crises of the modern world, which we also sometimes have produced ourselves, but still um, this, this decision is an issue that in France, for example, is very well known, where very many people already are saying now, well, what we would need most is some form of, of more or less even authoritarian reform in order to bring the state again on some some path uh, towards a, a brighter future. Um, that, that atmosphere is growing stronger and stronger. And in order to avoid now the West uh, collapsing really into, into authoritarianism, into social unrest and so on, it is needed by conservatives to be aware of all that fact and to implement this, when the time is ripe, this agenda of what I called Hesperialism. That is the situation for the West. Of course, the East of Europe is in a somewhat different situation situation as at least for the moment. I don't see in countries such as Poland or Hungary, the Visegrad countries, even the southeastern uh, Europe, I don't see a, a similar potential of, of implosion. I think these countries are much more stable. Uh, they are characterized by, the much, by a much greater cultural, but also social and ethnical homogeneity that could form some element that may protect them. Already now we see that in the corona crisis, they managed to somehow uh, uh, assure much better economy economic growth, they are much more stable. And so I simply can't see scenes of riots, of violence, of civic disobedience and disorder in Warsaw, as you can see them now in Paris or even some days ago in, in Lyon. I think the East may be much more stable than the West and perhaps uh, growingly also uh, be, be a model for a new construction or reconstruction of an alternative form of European unification once uh, the, the current um, uh, cultural mainstream has led itself to, uh, the, to, 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 to some form of absurdity uh, and we lose credibility with uh, the, the large masses of electors and voters who will simply realize that, um, that this isn't the path we can, we can go along without losing any, everything that characterizes us as a civilization. This is wonderful to, to be able to end on this note because it is a sort of a West European cultural roadmap that you outline in your book. It is, uh, it will find, I think, a, uh, hopefully an attentive, if not a, an optimistic or an enthusiastic audience in Western Europe, uh, primarily where you're trying to drum up um, sort of a sense of, you know, um, cultural awakening uh, at a time of, of crisis. But I, I do like that we're ending on a note of just um, even kind of within the cultural space that we're trying to revive, uh, spotlighting some of the obvious differences. And um, you, you still kind of bring together in this project a number of uh, intellectuals from different corners of, of, um, of the old world. And, um, and, and it is a task that has to be taken up by folks from across the, um, the, the spectrum of space, right? And um, I'm so glad we're ending on this note. And I, I would really, really encourage everyone watching this, uh, this stream uh, to get a copy of uh, Renovatio Europae. It is a uh, delightful set of essays touching on uh, different aspects of David's um, thought uh, as it has matured over the years regarding the questions of, of um, a, a European renewal. Uh, and, um, and really, David, thank you so much for availing yourself and, uh, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be able to speak to you on another occasion as, this, as the um, news cycle doesn't cease to kind of provide the opportunities for these kinds of conversations. So thank you so much for availing I feel so. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the invitation and for, for, for our discussion. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. That is all the time we have for this episode. If you like what you've watched, stay tuned for future episodes on YouTube and across the ECR Party social media presence. Thank you.